Welcome to Crime, Corruption, and Cocktails, the true crime podcast where we look at cases of corruption and negligence and examine their historical and cultural implications. Today, I'm drinking a mango white claw. What are you having, Jenny? I'm drinking a Mai Tai, and on today's episode, we're looking at the Texas cadet killers and the murder of Adrian Jones. Adrian Jones, or AJ as she was known to friends, was born on June 18, 1979 in Texas to parents Bill and Linda Jones. She had two younger brothers. As a teenager, she was an honors student and a star of the Mansfield High School soccer and cross-country teams. After graduation, Adrian planned to attend Texas A&M University and become a behavioral analyst. On top of her busy schedule, Adrian also worked part-time at a local fast food restaurant. Her manager, Tina Dollar, said she was great with the customers and lifted everyone's spirits. Her peers thought of her as charming, popular, and full of school spirit. By her mother Linda's admission, Adrian quote-unquote craved attention. She was known as a flirt and had many potential suitors, though she was not considered promiscuous. On December 3rd, 1995, Adrian was talking on the phone with her new boyfriend, Tracy Smith, when she got another call. Linda walked by around this time and noticed that her daughter's demeanor changed. When Linda asked who was on the phone, Adrian said, quote, oh, that was David from Cross Country and he's upset about something, end quote. Linda remembered that at 1045, Adrian was still awake and was ironing her clothes for school the next day and she seemed antsy. The next morning, Adrian was gone. At first, her parents thought she had gone for a run, but when they found her running shoes in her room, they began to worry and filed a missing persons report around 8 a.m. Earlier that same morning, a farmer was driving down a country road in nearby Grand Prairie, Texas, when he noticed a body, quote unquote, weaved into a barbed wire fence. The victim's head was caved in on the left side and bullet holes were clearly seen on her left cheek and forehead. There were abrasions to the neck and chest and lacerations to her brain. Unfortunately, the body would be identified as 16-year-old Adrian Jones. Police searched Adrian's bedroom and there were no signs of forced entry or abduction. There was also no sign of a struggle at the crime scene and no signs that Adrian had been sexually assaulted. To law enforcement, it appeared that whoever killed her knew her and she likely went willingly with the culprit. Though Adrian's murder hit the small town of Mansfield hard, it did not receive much media attention as they were instead focused on the kidnapping and murder of Amber Hagerman, who we also have an episode on. Adrian's family was immensely grief struck. Her mother wore a piece of her clothing every day, and she contacted psychics to help her find out who murdered her daughter. Detectives began interviewing Adrian's classmates, family, co-workers, and acquaintances. Police first suspected a local teen named Tara who had attacked one of Adrian's friends after hearing that she had had a sexual encounter with her boyfriend, but her alibi checked out. At some point, they questioned 18-year-old David Graham, a fellow cross-country team member and junior ROTC battalion commander. His peers described Graham as smart, a gentleman, and a cool guy. Surprisingly, most people didn't think Adrian and David were even friends. Police only looked into him after Linda had contacted the cross-country coach seeking information. Graham was clearly affected by Adrian's murder and was seen crying. He was soon cleared by police. Authorities then turned their attention to Brian McMillan, who was quickly arrested. McMillan was allegedly obsessed with Adrian and known to harass her at work to the point that she would have to hide when she saw him. However, detectives only had limited circumstantial evidence, and after Brian passed a polygraph, quote-unquote, with flying colors, he was released from jail and cleared as a suspect. With little more to go off of, investigators combed through their interviews for any bit of information that could help. They remembered that one of Adrian's younger brothers said he saw a pickup truck drive away from the family's house around midnight on the night of Adrian's disappearance. Adrian's manager at work told police that Adrian had shown her a photo 
that she had kept in her wallet of David Graham with his pickup truck. Despite this, there was not enough evidence to consider David a suspect, and the case slowed down. At the time of Adrian's murder, he was engaged to 18-year-old Diane Zamora, who went to a neighboring high school. The couple had been together for four months and were inseparable. Diane was quote-unquote careful around guys and proudly told her family that she was saving herself for marriage. She was also an academic achiever. Diane's family felt that David truly cared for her. They studied together, and when Diane was in a car accident, he was constantly by her side in the hospital. Not long after their engagement, Diane lost her virginity to David, which made her more committed to him than ever before. One relative recalled Diane saying, quote, If I can't be Mrs. David Graham, then I will die as Miss Diane Zamora, end quote. Following a cross-country meet on November 4, 1995, David claimed he and Adrian quote-unquote hooked up. According to David, she asked him for a ride home and requested that he take turns that were out of the way. They eventually pulled over and had sex. Some of Adrian's friends think she would have kept her distance from David. As one friend pointed out, Adrian had her standards. She would never sleep with another girl's boyfriend. Though some sources say David kept this a secret, others claim that he bragged about the encounter to his friends. Almost a year had passed since Adrian's murder. David started basic U.S. Air Force training in Colorado, and Diane was attending the U.S. Naval Academy in Annapolis with the intent of transferring to Air Force training to be with David. While in Annapolis, their relationship started to fall apart, largely due to Diane's paranoia and jealousy. She began to get close and confide in her squad leader, Jay Guild. Jay remembered Diane being convinced David was cheating on her and going into quote-unquote crying fits when David didn't answer her emails. She told Guild that David had cheated on her. At some point, Diane told Jay that she was considering breaking up with David and that they should start dating. She then sent David an email telling him that Jay had kissed her. When David heard about Diane and Jay, he attempted to contact naval officials to inform them that Jay was sexually harassing Diane. He sent a threatening email to Jay demanding that he have nothing to do with Diane. One person close to the investigation said that David wrote Diane letters begging her not to deceive him. In the letters, David would write such lines as, quote, remember what binds us together, end quote. During their summer together, Jay had asked Diane what she did about David cheating on her. She reportedly told him that she asked David to kill the other girl and she had watched David kill a girl named Adrian. She never said anything about participating in the crime. Jay thought Diane was saying this to get attention and did not report her claims. However, not long after, she repeated the same story to her two roommates. Though they were skeptical, her roommates reported her comment to a Navy chaplain. Not long after, Texas detectives made their way to Annapolis. When confronted, Diane claimed to have made up the story in order to appear tough to her peers. Diane was temporarily suspended as police continued their investigation. On her way home, she stopped in Colorado to visit David. Law enforcement then questioned him, and at first he said he had no idea why Diane would make up a story like that, but eventually David wrote a four and a half page confession letter. In it, he admitted to being full of guilt and shame after having sex with Adrian and how she ruined his quote unquote perfect and pure relationship with Diane. He said that Diane coerced him to kill Adrian by threatening to leave him if he didn't. He wrote, quote, I didn't have any harsh feelings for Adrian, but no one could stand between me and Diane, end quote. According to his confession, Diane told him that killing Adrian was the only way to resolve the problems he'd caused by his sexual indiscretion. David admitted to calling Adrian the night of December 4th and picking her up in Diane's parents' car as Diane hid in the hatchback. David claimed that he held Adrian down in her reclined seat as Diane then brutally beat her on the head with a dumbbell, but she didn't die as quickly as they had hoped. Adrian escaped the vehicle but was not able to make it far because of her injuries. David grabbed a Marikov 9mm, followed her, and shot her twice, execution style, in the face. 
He wrote, quote, she ran into a nearby field and collapsed. In that short instant, I knew I couldn't leave the key witness to our crime alive. I just pointed and shot. I fired again and ran to the car. Diane and I drove off. The first things out of her mouth were, I love you, end quote. He then claimed that Diane said, quote, we shouldn't have done that, David, end quote. Diane and David then drove to a mutual friend's house covered in blood and begged him not to ask any questions. The friend never reported anything to the police. Following his confession, police recovered the dumbbell and gun used in the murder from David's house. It didn't take long for Diane to confess as well. In her written confession, she said that everything started when she pestered David about past relationships. This led to an argument in which David confessed to having sex with Adrian. Diane then claimed she attempted to hit David with the brass rod and repeatedly hit her head into a wall before screaming, quote, kill her, kill her, end quote. She said they spent the weekend prior to the murder trying to get in touch with Adrian to no avail. Their plan was for David to break Adrian's neck and dump her body in a local lake. According to Diane, around 1.30 a.m. on December 4th, David picked Adrian up as she hid in the truck. They drove around for 15 and 20 minutes before David pulled over and motioned for Diane to come out. She jumped out, and as David held Adrian down, Diane asked her about their sexual encounter. Adrian replied that she didn't enjoy it, and there were lots of guilt. David then began wrestling with Adrian. Thinking Adrian would hurt David, Diane claimed she hit Adrian with the dumbbell. Adrian managed to escape, and upon Diane's request, David shot Adrian to make sure she was dead. Following the murder, Diane cleaned the car as David was sick to his stomach. They were convinced that they would be caught immediately. Following the murder, they became committed to attending church and praying for forgiveness. The town of Mansfield, Texas was shocked and changed forever by their omission of guilt. Both David and Diane recanted their confessions and blamed the other for Adrian's murder. In 1997, Lifetime produced a TV movie about the case called Love's Deadly Triangle, The Texas Cadet Murder. Adrian's family had objections to the movie and the defense seemed worried it would not give their clients a fair trial. Diane's trial began in February 1998 with David starting in July of the same year. During David's trial, it was discovered that Adrian Davis, cross-country coach, had actually driven Adrian home on the day David claimed they had been intimate, which supported his recantation. However, he ultimately repudiated his recantation, saying his lawyer had pressured him to lie, and again claimed to have sex with Jones. Adding that to Diane's claims in her confession that Adrian admitted to having sex with David, when she asked her about it just before the murder, making it possible that David and Adrian had had a sexual encounter at a time other than the date David claimed. David and Diane were both found guilty, and at the request of Adrian's family, they were sentenced to life in prison. Both have since married other individuals, and in 2008, Diane divorced her husband. Today, Diane maintains her innocence, saying, Though she was with David on the night of Adrian's murder, she only wanted to talk to Adrian and that David was responsible for the killing. Interestingly, she became friends with Yolanda Saldivar, the woman who murdered singer Selena Perez in 1995 when they were in prison together. Both David and Diane are eligible for parole in 2036 and the former couple is no longer in contact with each other. Adrian's family has kept private since the trial, but they hope that her memory lives on. Tell, so what are your thoughts on this wild, wild story? This was definitely one of the more interesting Lifetime movies when it first came out and I watched it. I definitely don't believe that Adrian and David had any type of sexual encounter with each other. I definitely think that he was lying. I think if you take into account what Adrian's friends has said about her preferences and the fact that David claims to have sex with her but not know when it happened, definitely supports that. I think that in this case, Diane was angry and she created a delusion in her mind about 
a supposed sexual encounter that happened between David and Adrian, and that led to her being a full participant in the murder with David. I definitely don't think that she was a innocent party just trying to talk to Adrian. I don't think that makes sense. And I definitely think that if it was not for her encouragement and insistence that David kill Adrian, I don't think that Adrian would be dead today. This is definitely a case where you see the ultimate ramifications of jealousy and it goes back to her statement of if I can't be Mrs. David Graham, then I will die as Miss Diane Zamora. Like you've been with someone for four months and you're already speaking in terms of you would die without them. That is definitely speaking to a very ill mind and someone who was so wrapped up in their relationship and the quote unquote purity of their relationship that I definitely believe that they would murder to preserve it. What about you? I do have my doubts about David's claims. I don't know what to think because obviously if Diane is telling the truth, then, you know, she's telling the truth. I I find it weird that Adrian would say like, yes, she did if she didn't. But then, like you said, her friends did say she wouldn't do that. In one of the articles I read with an interview from one of her friends, they said they didn't think she'd do it because that friend had, I guess, been in kind of like a cheating relationship with a guy. And she said Adrian was really upset with her about it and would bring it up constantly. So I don't really see if Adrian is clearly not okay with people cheating. I don't see that she would do that. But who knows? I do agree that I think that Diane is kind of like the spark to this whole thing. This is like the perfect example of toxic, crazy teenage love gone wrong. I think a lot of people can relate to, you know, when you're a teenager in love, it's like just this intense infatuation and feeling like you're on top of the world. And then like the plummet, just your life is ruined when anything takes that away. I do think it's very strange that after four months of dating, they were engaged. Who knows if that's maybe, I don't know, it could be a mix of like, they were both, I think, pretty Christian and religious. So maybe that could influence it. Maybe like being in the South influences that. I know also people in the military tend to marry young. So that's an influence too. It's strange. And it did seem like even before, maybe not before Adrian's murder, but I mean, they were obviously bound by Adrian's murder and their obsession with each other was just so, so, so much. And really just unhealthy and I agree I don't think Adrian would have died if it wasn't for Diane kind of stoking the fire and David you know being fearful and giving in and of course he is very much responsible because at any moment he could have said no I'm not doing this or he could have turned himself in there's many many things he could have done that could have saved Adrian's life or I don't know made her just it wouldn't have led to her death in the first place or her, you know, attack in the first place. Like we said, I think some of these other layers, I think like the layer of the military involving this case is kind of interesting too, because Jay, the person that Diane was kind of confiding in at school, he lost his position within the academy because he didn't come forward. And I thought that was really interesting. And that exact reason is why her roommates did come forward because of, I guess, whatever oath that you take uh, within the academy to tell the truth and uphold the truth and admit when people are doing something wrong and illegal. And then I think part of why David confessed was because his superiors within his training did say like, these are the standards we have to uphold. And I thought that was really interesting and kind of not something we see that often. So it's a, another interesting layer for me to this case. I was going to just agree. I think that the military, though it does have a bad reputation for how it deals with certain crimes, definitely the responsibilities that they put on soldiers in terms of their morality, 
I think that it helped in this case because there was a simmering guilt that David felt. And I think that is the reason why this case was solved. I think that without his confession, we could be in a situation where this is an unsolved murder. Yeah, I can absolutely see that happening. Do you think either of them will be paroled? Because it's coming up pretty soon. Honestly, I can see, unfortunately, Diane being paroled. In a lot of these cases, the female of the pair is able to claim diminished responsibility. And I think Diane may go for that. And if the prosecution or Adrian's family is not there to really speak to her role in it, you know, she might be paroled. I don't see David being paroled. I think the fact that, like you said, he could have stepped in and stopped at any time. And the fact that he admitted that at a certain point, Adrian had escaped and it was his progressive action of firing those shots that ultimately ended her life. I think that that would likely make him ineligible or at least parole not being uh, granted once he requests it. I would say personally, I definitely don't want either of them paroled. It's definitely is some bias against Diane for everything that she did. And the fact that she became friends with Yolanda Saldivar just leaves a very bad taste in my mouth. What about you? I can see them getting paroled. I don't know. Maybe I'm like 75, 25 on seeing it happen where it's most likely not, but I can see it. I guess partially because I don't know how at risk they are of like reoffending. Who's to say? But they are in Texas and that's a very tough on crime state. I wouldn't be surprised if they didn't. But you made a good point about Diane possibly getting paroled. My only thing that makes me think maybe she wouldn't is because she admitted to guilt and then recanted it and has maintained her innocence since then. And David has been more, I guess, open to admitting his guilt. So I don't know. Maybe they would take that into consideration. I don't know if they should get out. I don't know. I also thought that was so bizarre that her and Yolanda became friends. And in the one article I found, I think Diane had like filed some kind of report or complaint because the other inmates were bullying them, she said. And I thought like, oh, to be a fly on the wall in that prison, in that scenario, if only. So this case is... I guess you could say an example of a love triangle. Like we said, there is a little bit of question about David and Adrian's relationship, but for all intents and purposes, we'll say this is an example of a love triangle. And there are many, many other cases of love triangles that have led to murder or violence. Doing my research for this, I googled deadly love triangle and there were over 9 million results on Google. So... That is just to give you an idea of how prevalent, I guess, this is. In a study from the 1997 Violence and Victims Journal, author R.B. Felsen found that love triangles are a more important motive when women commit homicide than when men commit homicide. Women usually kill their lover, while males usually kill their rival, which was a little bit of a um, switch in this case. Male attacks on male rivals reflect identity concerns, according to their data. Anger at both the partner and rival also depends on the assignment of blame. The aggrieved party may attack the partner or rival in order to gain retribution or deter future episodes. The study says, quote, while people may behave impulsively in the sense that they fail to consider costs and consequences, their behavior is still the result of a decision making process, end quote. In a love triangle, the actor harms others for three reasons, to force compliance, to achieve retributive justice, and to protect or enhance social identities. Their behavior also reflects considerations of costs and moral inhibitions. So now we're going to look at two other examples of love triangles that either ended in murder or possible almost violent situation. So the first case that of Clara Harris and the murder of David Lynn Harris. 
In July of 2002, Clara Harris confronted her husband, David Lynn Harris, in a hotel parking lot over an extramarital affair, then struck and ran him over with her Mercedes-Benz sedan, killing him in an act of maridocide. The couple, who were both dentists, married in February 1992 and had three children, including David's daughter from a previous marriage. At some point, David began an affair with his former receptionist, Gail Bridges. Suspicious of her husband, Clara hired a private investigator who confirmed the affair on July 24th. That evening, Clara went to the Hilton Hotel in Dayu Bay, Texas, to confront her husband and reportedly attack Bridges in the lobby. Hotel employees escorted Clara to her vehicle. When David and Bridges came out of the hotel, Clara struck down her husband in the parking lot as her teen stepdaughter, Lindsay, sat in the passenger seat. According to the medical examiner's office, they could only be certain that there was one tire mark on the body, but Lindsay and eyewitnesses assert Clara ran over David three times. David was dead at the scene and Clara was charged with murder. During the trial, Lindsay testified against her stepmother, claiming she told her to stop the vehicle. The prosecution claimed Clara's actions were more than a crime of passion, but that she quote-unquote wanted to hurt David, as she was heard saying in a police interview. Also introduced at her trial was a videotape of the crime recorded by the detective agency Clara had hired when she suspected David of the affair. The video was especially damning as it showed her circling in her Mercedes around the parking lot three times, although David is not clearly seen in the video. Clara then parks her car next to his body. The defense's attempts to prove that Clara ran over David only once crumbled when the judge ruled their recreation of the crime by a private consultant inadmissible in court. She was convicted of sudden passion and sentenced to 20 years in prison and was granted parole in 2017. This case was also covered in a Lifetime original movie titled Suburban Madness. Our next case is that of Lisa Nowak. In February 2007, NASA astronaut Lisa Nowak drove 900 miles from Houston, Texas to Orlando, Florida. In her car, she had a trench coat, black wig, pepper spray, a BB gun, rope, trash bags, an eight-inch knife, and other items. She also had space diapers with her so she wouldn't have to stop for bathroom breaks. Nowak was wearing a black wig and trench coat when she approached Colleen Shipman's car in the parking lot of Orlando International Airport. She banged on Shipman's vehicle and begged for a ride. When Shipman rolled down her window, Nowak sprayed her with pepper spray and tried to get in the car. Unhurt, Shipman fled the scene. Nowak had been waiting in the airport for Shipman's plane to land for about an hour and a half. Shipman drove off to the parking lot booth where she called the police. Police arrested Nowak on attempted murder and kidnapping charges. Shipman had recently begun dating Bill Olflin, an astronaut who had recently dated Nowak. Olwak thought Nowak took the breakup well and hoped they could still be friends. Shipman would later claim that Nowak was stalking her for two months. Phone records show that Noah called Ophelin at least 12 times and sent seven text messages the day after he returned from his space shuttle flight on December 22, 2006. During December and January, over 100 calls were made, although it is unclear who called whom. And I wanted to mention, too, that Ophelin did give Noah um, a phone for her to call him with. Under questioning by NASA and military investigators, Oakland reportedly stated that he had broken off the relationship with Noak. He did, however, have lunch with her in his apartment at least once in January. They continued to train together for a bicycle race, and they went to the gym together for months. The case was called the Astronaut Love Triangle and forced NASA to update their policies and physical and psychiatric evaluations. Nowak pleaded guilty in 2009 to a reduced charge of burglary and misdemeanor battery. During the court hearing, she said she was quote-unquote sincerely sorry for her actions and promised that she would never contact Ophelin again. She was given a year of probation. In 2010, she received 
a quote unquote, other than honorable discharge from the Navy. O'Flynn and Shipman married in 2010 and settled in Alaska, and their careers also received uh, repercussions. Del, any thoughts on either of these cases? Were you familiar with them? The first case I was familiar with, and it's still a wild story to hear again. I still kind of have this picture in my mind of her circling the parking lot to make sure that she repeatedly hit her husband. It's just a wild scene to think. Though I will say that I forgot that her stepdaughter was in the car with her. And I could just imagine the horror that she was going through as she saw kind of first person view her father being ran over. When it comes to the astronaut case, I just think 900 miles for you to try to kidnap someone because they're dating your ex-boyfriend. Talk about definitely not taking the breakup well and not getting over someone. It's just a wild and ridiculous story. I think that a year of probation definitely doesn't seem to fit the crime. The fact that she was stalking her, the fact that she sprayed her, I think that luckily she wasn't hurt, which is probably why she was given such a low sentence. And hopefully she is in a much better place mentally and is able to have some sort of positive relationship going forward. I do think it's sweet that Ophelin and Shipman got married um, and, you know, were able to settle down together. It's a shame that their careers received repercussions because from what I'm seeing and reading, they definitely seem to be the victims in this. I don't know if it was maybe related to something within the policies of NASA that they violated, and that's why they received repercussions, but it definitely doesn't seem fair. What are your thoughts? They're both really interesting. The first one of Clara Harris and David Harris, I have seen like countless story, like shows about this whether it's like a lifetime movie or the women who kill specials or jilted love whatever you i'm pretty sure can find the tape of her in the parking lot i think it's like kind of notorious it is really sad that her stepdaughter was in there and of course like i completely understand her being upset about her husband cheating on her but you don't You can't do that as much as maybe like you want to in your head. You got to have some restraint. And I find it so crazy too that it's the agency that she hired to help her that videotaped it and really screwed her over the most in court. And then Lisa Nowak, I remember this was like a huge story when this came out. And this is another one that really got like, made fun of a lot in the media, especially on talk shows. And it is a bizarre story. I want to know what she was going to do to her with this BB gun. I mean, she had rope, trash bags, a knife, and a BB gun. I mean, that sounds like some damage could have been done. Such a bizarre story. And then, of course, having them all be involved in NASA and astronauts. Another, like... I'm sure that is part of why the media clung on to this story. And like you said, driving 900 miles, you definitely didn't take the breakup well. And that's understandable. Stuff like that is hard. Pepper spray people as much as you want to. I'm sorry to be laughing. I'm glad no one was really hurt. But it's just, I have not heard a story like that since. I'll say that. I hope they're all in a good place now, too. I'm sure it's really embarrassing for everyone involved. I do think that there was some kind of policy, which is why they got the career repercussions, but I don't know exactly what it was. But yes, it's a very, very interesting story that I'm glad we got to talk about. And I wanted to mention, too, we're talking about how there's so many different love triangle stories Adrian Jones, this her murder was in Texas. These two cases also started in Texas too. So three in one state alone in this like like ten year time period that we're talking about. At least there's a lot more to it. So next we are going to talk about why people kill for love. According to a report from the UK Center for Crime and Justice Studies, 
studies motives for murder can be condensed into four sets of L's, lust, love, loathing, and loot. In an Australian study on nonviolent relationships in which one romantic partner killed the other, the most common reasons for intimate partner homicide was jealousy, followed by gain, and then love. Jealousy homicides involve an offender thinking they are at risk of losing their partner to someone else. Either the offender's lover or their rival may be the target of these homicides. Homicides motivated by love are committed so the offender can remove a person they love from a situation they believe to be quote-unquote worse than death. This can manifest in two ways. Altruistic homicides may involve an offender perceiving the situation to be so bad that they would rather see the victim die than be alive to experience it. Alternately, homicides perpetrated by assisting a loved one to commit suicide may also be motivated by love, though we did want to note that these are very rare in Australia. Love homicides accounted for 17% of the homicides examined in the study. Unsurprisingly, they often involved older couples. The victims in these homicides were usually very sick, suffering from chronic physical and mental illnesses. The most common cause of death in love homicides was poison. Four of the five love homicides were committed by husbands who killed their wives. This is in contrast to love homicides committed outside of intimate partnerships, such as the killing of a child, filicide, where a female offender was more likely to be involved. In the love homicides involving couples, none had a history of domestic violence. So a little different than what we talked about in today's case, but thought it was worth mentioning. Del, do you have any final thoughts on killing for love or anything else we talked about? I think that it's always interested when high emotions lead to homicides. And I think that love homicides just show that it's not always the negative emotions that we think about, anger. It could also be something that in general is a really positive thing that gets taken to the extreme and, you know, the most unfortunate of ways. What about you? Yeah, it is really interesting to see how these these emotions play out. Because I think love and hate, love, anger, whatever, are the most, some of the most intense for people. And they make people do the craziest things. I know that there's like love addicts, people say they're love is a drug. And it definitely can make people do things they normally wouldn't, much like a drug would. It's really interesting to see, you know, how people's minds work. And I think with Diane and David and Adrian, I think it is pretty interesting. Because they I don't think in a lot of these like love cases or love triangle cases, we don't see the couple team up essentially to kill the quote unquote rival in the love triangle, I think uh, another interesting aspect. And like we were saying too, with teenagers, everything is just like incredibly heightened 10 times more. So these intense feelings are just like uncontrollable. That wraps up this week's case. Thank you for listening. Let us know in the comments what you think about the murder of Adrian Jones. You can read more about this case and how to support us in the links below. We will be back next week with a brand new episode. As always, stay safe.